G'day everyone, it's Wes Leak here from Business Blessings and I wanted to welcome you to episode 10 of our Business Blessings radio. This is uh, a message that I did about a year ago actually at the Christian Church here in Brisbane on a message entitled Lingering Longer. It's about Mary and how she lingered longer at the tomb and uh, as a result of that she had a further encounter with Jesus. You know, the other disciples, Peter and Mark, came and went very quickly, but uh, Mary didn't do that. She lingered longer, and as a result, she got an incredible um, encounter with Jesus, and I just want to encourage you to linger longer. So have a listen. Uh, I'd love to hear your feedback. Reach out to me if you've got any questions, but bless you as the Father speaks to you as you listen to this today. Well, could we stand this morning? I want to introduce you to a very fine man that we've had the privilege of journeying with. Wes is and does many things, but what I love about him the most is his passion to see people, you and I, any room that he walks into, his family, his children, become the people of God that they are destined to be. Prepare your hearts this morning to receive what the Lord has for you and I today. Let's welcome Wes as he comes. God bless. Thank you. I'm actually going to sit. Is that okay? We can't have prophetic words like the McRae's dust gave to us and not act on them, can we? So I want to give you permission this morning. This is not a traditional sermon. This is an invitation to you to have an encounter with God. So I... I actually want to give you permission to move. We have plenty of space in this auditorium. If you know the person next to you is going to distract you, it's time to move. Because I don't want you distracted this morning. Now, (laughs) see, seriously, like I was just joking. Look, I sense God really wants to minister individually this morning. So if you, if you feel free at any time to move. Feel free at any time. If you need to come and lay on the floor or go to the back or do whatever God is calling you to do, you have permission to do that. And leaders, can I just ask that you keep an eye on what's happening this morning in case you need to run and pray for someone, okay? Got that. I do not know how today is going to go, but I know that God has it in control. So that's good. Uh, At the moment, you're actually being handed out the scripture. So the passage, the title for today is Lingering Longer. Lingering Longer. And uh, we are going to need more time. Is that okay? (laughs) So if you need to leave at any time, just walk out. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to be here for three hours. I'm just saying if you need to leave to do that. I want to thank Aaron and Micah for the privilege of doing uh, speaking this morning. I am very conscious of that this is a holy place. This is holy ground. And the history of this place, of what God has done, but more importantly, the history of what God wants to create in this place as well. The other thing that I sense this morning is God wants to say thank you to you for coming. You didn't have to be here today, but God... Have you seen my T-shirt? God has called the meeting. Are you going? God called this meeting this morning. Aaron and Micah didn't call the meeting. The board didn't call the meeting. God called the meeting this morning. And you have responded to that invitation. God is calling many meetings with you. (laughs) He's calling daily meetings, sometimes hourly meetings, sometimes minute-by-minute meetings. And he's saying, I want to meet with you. So we're going to read, the passage that we're going to look at today is a bit of a long one. It's John 20, 1 to 18. And so you're being handed that today. The reason why I am handing it out to you is one, if you have a pen and you want to make notes as you go. But two, this is not just a scripture for this morning. This is a scripture for the week. And you'll see up the top, I've got two things. A prayer which comes from 1 Samuel 3, 10. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And that's, that's a heart cry for you at any time to stop and say, speak, Lord, I'm listening to you. One of the things, um, <laughs> I think I said this when I spoke to the Wednesday morning group, well, I, I've done something I shouldn't have done. 
here's a confession. I actually started to listening to people praying in prayer meetings. And I'd actually encourage you not to do that. <laughs> I, I am joking a bit there. Um, because I got to the point of thinking, actually, even I wouldn't answer that prayer. And I think I'm a pretty generous God. <laughs> guy, not God. One of the things that I've noticed, what's happening, uh, you know, I do have a privileged position of looking and working with different leaders of different prayer movements around Australia. And one of the things that is, seems to be on top of God's agenda at the moment is we don't come to a prayer meeting with an agenda. We don't come to a prayer meeting with an agenda. What does that mean? Open heart. Open ears. Jesus is interceding for you and me right now. The throne room of God. I want to know what he's interceding for me about. Do you want to know that? So when we come to a prayer meeting, our responsibility is to sit and listen and say, Father, what are you interceding for us about? How can we join you? So often it's been the other way around. And we're very good Pentecostals, aren't we? We get into a prayer meeting. We can yell and scream and pray in tongues and do all this great stuff and come out feeling like we've accomplished something. But was that what God wanted to do? It may have been. It may, it may, well, it may have been. But what I've been sensing lately is... You know, Second Chronicles 17, if my people will humble themselves and pray, that humbling is actually coming in and saying, God, I have no agenda in this meeting. My agenda is to meet with you. That means that I don't pray what I want to have prayed. You know, like we, you know we have some dear friends who are very ill at the moment. And, of course, we want them to be raised up and healed but I've had to stop and say, God, but what do you want to happen? What do you want to happen? Because it may be a prayer for something specific about them today, that they need their facing today, that they, they're uncomfortable or something, you know, whatever it is, then God knows that. We're very good at Pentecostals believing for people to be healed to the minute they die. And then we're at the funeral expecting for them to come out of the coffin. I've been there. I know that. But maybe it was God's will for them to go home at that time. And that's very hard to accept. Catholics are very good at preparing people to die. <laughs> you know, sometimes, we, sometimes the will of God is actually to prepare a person to meet their Heavenly Father and to walk alongside them to take them through, is there anything in your life that God wants to sort out before you want to meet him face to face? There are other times that he wants to see people healed and raised up. And we've seen story of story. This church has witnessed story. We heard testimony today of that as well. What I'm saying to you is let's ask God first. Let's ask God first. Let's read this passage together. Early on the first day, that, so let me give background. Jesus has died. This is Sunday morning. This was the sermon I was going to, well, it's actually not the sermon I was going to do on Easter Sunday morning, but I've still kept the same passage. Um, they've had the Sabbath day and Mary got up early because there was some practical stuff that they, the women wanted to do with the body. They wanted to uh, anoint it with oil. What I want to say right from the start is God meets with you when you need to, in the practical stuff that you need to do, the normal ceremonial stuff, which was what the situation was here. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. 
both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the stripes of the linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Take note of this little next sentence. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked a woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I'll go and get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, picture that moment. Jesus uh, Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am sending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. In the top right hand corner, you'll see I've got numbers one, three to seven. That's because when you go home today, You're going to read it one, seven times, this passage. And you're going to tick off every time that you've read it. There is something about lingering longer with the Word of God. I would love to read this passage to you seven times this morning, but we don't have time to do that. One of the reasons is that when we often sit down and start to read Scripture, our mind is elsewhere when we start. By about the fourth time, it suddenly kicks into gear. And the fifth and sixth and seventh, you suddenly start to hear what God has to say. I'm not against reading through the Bible in a year. But if you're doing that just to get through the Bible, please stop and linger with the passage of Scripture. Sit and linger with the Word of God. There's some... A number of characters in this story. You've got Mary Magdalene. You've got Simon Peter. You've got the one that Jesus loved, who was John, who wrote this passage. You've got the angels. And you've got Jesus. Let's have a look at Simon Peter. Bless this man. I probably see a lot of myself in him. Do you see a lot of yourself in Simon Peter? He can be very, let's get in, let's get this sorted and let's move on type person. Is that right? I had something interesting happen to me in December. And that was someone said to me, get behind me, Satan. They said that to me. And it it was in the context of a difficult situation because... um, Uh, One of the boards I sit on, there were some relationships that had broken down. And I'd I'd said to the guy, you need to go get those relationships right. And he'd said to me, well, that's their problem. It's not my problem. And I said, mate, it's your problem. And then he said to me, get behind me, Satan. And I thought, I was, can you imagine if someone said that to you? It's interesting, though, that if you actually sit with this passage, if you sat with that passage in Matthew 16 where that happened, it was actually Jesus being very loving to Peter. It was actually Jesus being very loving to Peter. We think it was a very strong fatherly rebuke tearing him down. But you read the rest of the story. That's only the first part of the scripture. 
Because if you go on in that in Matthew sixteen twenty two, you know it's interesting that Peter had actually taken. So, so let me give you a background to this. Jesus, this is when Jesus first started talking to his people that he needed to die and be risen again. Peter thought, no, because like you and me, we have dreams and desires for what we want to see God do. Is that right? Peter's dreams and desires was for Jesus to become king of Israel. That was to be a physical king in that place. So he quietly, like the passage says, he quietly pulled Jesus aside. This happened in a quiet situation. And Peter said, said, so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Imagine rebuking Jesus, (laughs) the gall of a guy. (laughs) God forbid, Lord, this must not happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter. Can you see, like, I picture him very lovingly turning to Peter and saying, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and here is the reason, because you are setting your mind on, you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. So this is why it comes back to some of the stuff I'm talking about prayer at the moment, because a lot of time we go into a prayer meeting, we're setting our hearts on man's interests and praying that. We're not setting our heart on God's interests and praying that. This is like this is hurtful. Like it's this is, but this is the lovingness of God because what He's trying to do is to move us onto His agenda. He's trying to move us onto His agenda, and I have an agenda for my kids. Do you have an agenda for your kids? <laughs> but so often, what my agenda is not their agenda. I mean, particularly eleven-year-old son. <laughs> What's his agenda and what is our agenda, pairs of body agenda for him, can clash all the time. Started this morning when we tried to get him up. You know, like it's just even in the simple things. Peter and, Peter and John ran to the tomb. John didn't go in. Peter went in, saw the situation. John went in and they ran back and told the disciples what happened. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But I want to say to you guys, I'm doing a comparison with Mary this morning because how often do we race to someone, get a prophetic word, and then race off and try to implement it? Yes, you're laughing, but it's true, isn't it? I need a word from God for this situation. So it's very fascinating to me that we go to a man of God. We don't go to God. Ouch. I'm guilty of this too. But God's been saying to me lately, your first port of call is me. Your first port of call is me. I had a situation recently where... Something was going on and it just didn't work out. And God said, well, let's review this, shall we? Let's just sit down and have a conversation about this. It was very good and it looked very good, but did you ask me about it? Uh, No. Well, why do you expect it? Of course, it blew up in your face, you know, because you didn't, it wasn't what I wanted you to do. It's fascinating to me that they still did not understand God wants to do something now with you guys. Take a breath. Father, we give you permission to do what you want to do in this place right now. I'm a crier, I know that. And Mary's crying, so it's okay, it matches the scripture. (laughs) Mary was standing at the tomb. She could not go in. Let me talk to you a bit about Mary. They say that she had seven demons that were cast out of her. Can you imagine the freedom that that was in her life? She was the one who anointed Jesus. They actually say that she is mentioned more in the Gospels than any other woman 
and some recognize her as one of the apostles because she was there the whole way. Can you imagine what was going through her mind? When you're standing at the tomb, knowing that your Lord has died, knowing that the one who has changed your life so incredibly has died. And you can't even bear to go into the tomb to see. She knows he's gone, but she is. How many of us are distraught like her? I made a list of some things. This morning I sense a number of you are standing outside an empty tomb. It's unfulfilled prophetic words. <laughs> I've had a number of conversations lately with people in their 60s and 70s who are still holding out on a prophetic word that was given to them in their 20s and 30s and they will not act until that word comes to pass. This is hard. This is hard. Some of you this morning are in that same situation and you need to let go of that word. You need to lay it down and say, God, we're moving on together. I know that there are some prophetic words that are still yet to come. I know that. But I want you to have a conversation with God about it and talk to him about it. There's a loss of hopes and dreams. We've seen that over the last, I was talking to someone on Thursday and he said, I feel like I've lost two years of my life. So he feels like he's behind where he felt to be. Some of you have lost dear jobs, not because of your, your own doing, but because of a government policy. Some of you have hired people that didn't work out, or you got a job, you thought this is the answer to everything, and it turned out to be not what you expected. Some of you are standing at the tomb with a marriage that has died. A relationship that has broken down. Some of you are standing there sensing that God was meant to provide and he hasn't. Well, according to you, he hasn't. Let's just clarify that. I ask God what it is that you're standing at the tomb crying about. It may be something that you think you've dead and buried long ago, but God wants to put your finger, his finger on it this morning and says, enough is enough. Some, some of you know Pam and my story that I was at a church service one Sunday morning and I didn't actually have any respect or honor for the person who was preaching. Isn't that terrible? I'm being very real with you this morning, aren't I? And um, he got up and started talking about that God wants to do something new in my life. And I thought, I don't respect you and there's no way, God, you want to do something new in me. Don't say that to God. <laughs> Learn from my experience. He said to me, you need to give up the thoughts of marrying the girl that you want to marry. Because I had this relationship with this girl and we, I'd been on a mission trip and came home. She broke it off and she said, you're not God's best for me. That's very hurtful. Anyhow, so this is three years down the track now. God said to you, it's time to let go of this. It's over. And um, so I did. That afternoon, went to a wedding and saw her for the first time in a long time. There was no feeling. It was all gone. God had all dealt with it. Anyhow, it was September that year that God started speaking to me about marrying Pam. And what are we now? 27 years down the track. Sometimes it's our own thoughts that are stopping the move of God happening. 
So the reason why God talks about in Romans 12 to be renewed in our minds. Because we have dreams and expectations of what we think should happen. There's a lot of that in this place. There's a lot of that in this place. Some of you, the 70s and 80s were a great time for Christianity, weren't they? You just think this Brisbane was pumping. We Clark was going for it. Trevor Chandler was going for it. Steve Ryder was going for it. Like, you know, so many. And there was others around as well. Some of us are longing for that to happen again. I think God wants to do something different. I'm not saying there was anything wrong, but, but there was a season. Have you noticed that God moves in seasons? Sometimes it's just, you know, sometimes financially you're just in a season because you've got, you're young, you're married, you're trying to get ahead, you've got kids. You know, it's a season for, you know, and it was so good when the kids started to get jobs and things and <laughs> they could pay for, like the pressure, you know, and I don't know what you guys know that Pam and I have moved out of home. <laughs> it's wonderful. I'd recommend it to anybody. You know, when your kids say to you, we're going to stay here till we're 30, I'm thinking, well, I'm not staying that long. Anyhow, I mean, that's a brief. But God moved us within 10 days, you know, at the end of last year, which was very, very quick. You know, one of the interesting things about that is when you've lived in a place for 20 years, you know how to get to places from that location. I don't know that anymore. So I have to go back to using the satnav. Like, you know, often, you know, you make an appointment, you think, oh, well, that's... And then you put in the satnav and think, actually, it's either shorter or longer. You know, it's a real... But that's what God's doing now. How many times have you walked into a meeting thinking, this is... You can go to a lot of church services, and Pentecostal churches are more... um, structured than perhaps Catholic and Anglican churches. Have you noticed? You go in to hippie, bouncy songs, the announcements, three worshipy, slow songs, communion, message, we leave. You know what's going to happen, you know? And um, I think is, is it sometimes, I think 96.5 on Sunday mornings, they have the same playlist and you know where they're up to by what time. Does anyone else notice that or is that just me? We're in a time where we don't know actually what God's doing. It. I don't think we really know what God's doing at this time. But what I do know is he's calling us to have that one-on-one with him to get ready to go. <sighs> Mary lingered longer at the tomb. She was in such pain. But because she lingered longer... <laughs> She had two very supernatural experiences. One was with the angels, and the other one was with Jesus himself. I sense God wants you to have some supernatural experiences with him, but it's not going to happen in a minute. It may not happen in an hour or a day. It may happen over a period of time if we linger longer with him. Mary did not recognize Jesus. Like, uh, 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 I've actually been sitting with this passage for about six weeks. And, uh, so, you know, I do a listening prayer thing on Wednesday mornings and we've looked at this twice. And, and on Wednesday morning we redid it because... I just wanted to get some fresh revelation for today. And one of the guys, as he's reading this, because what we do is we read the passage, then we go away for 20 minutes and sit with it and then come back and share what God said. God said to him, Jesus said to him, I've been staring you in the face and you have not seen me. Whoa. We live very busy lives. 
And sometimes we're looking around for Jesus, but we think he's, it's just the gardener. It's just this, it's just that. Jesus is actually there with you. And like Mary, we need our eyes open to see him. Can you imagine what must have gone through Mary's mind? This is why I love actually sitting with a passage and saying, okay, God, let's go through this. Let's have a look. Let's, who's there? What are they doing? What are they up to? But Jesus, I know you were there. And Jesus was there the whole time. She once heard a Catholic Archbishop from Canberra preach on this. And um, he focused on verse 16, where Jesus saying, All he did was call her name. This morning, Jesus is calling your name. He's actually calling your name. He's saying, Chelsea, I'm calling you. Aaron, I'm calling you. Sally, I'm calling you. School lunches need to be made. The beds have to be packed. The dishwasher has to be unloaded. The car's got to be serviced. If I don't go out and earn this money, blah, 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 blah. Jesus is calling your name. Some of you know that I've been promoting this little book called Two Chairs. And there's only a few left now at the front to, to take. Jackie, I'm giving this to you before I forget because otherwise it will go somewhere. Two Chairs is, is written by a guy called Bob Bodine. And it's a simple thing of setting up two chairs, one for you, one for God. You don't need to do that. But it helps. Because sometimes we need to... We need a little bit of help. And he just says, sit with God and ask him one question. God, what's on your heart for me today? Can you see? We have our agenda. We know what we need to do. But he said, I got a text the other night. A lady said to me on Monday morning, she sat down and God said to her, you need to visit your brother today. So she actually organized her family to go visit brother. There was nothing out of the ordinary, you know, he, but she was just so impressed to do that. He passed away on Tuesday. <laughs> Can you imagine if she didn't sit with God? That, I, I said to her, what if you hadn't have done your two chairs time that morning? God knows your day intimately. Ask him about it. He's called the meeting. You think that your boss has called the meeting? No, God's called the meeting. He wants to accomplish something. When you go into a meeting, God, what do you want to do in this meeting? I've done that and million dollar contracts have been signed. I'm thinking, and it was something left field. But sometimes God just wants to... Do you know what Bob says the most? He says, actually... The most thing that happens is that God loves on the people. I think God wants to love on you. I think he wants to strip away some stuff. Mary was a transformed woman because of the encounter she had with Jesus. And then... <laughs> she was over to go out and say, this is what the Lord has done. If we had a church that was transformed by the power of God going out, telling people this is what the Lord has done, can you imagine how the world would be changed? It's fascinating to me that the last time that Jesus was with them, in Luke 24, verse 45, it says, Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. 
I have a feeling that God wants to open our minds so that we can understand the scriptures afresh. You know, when you're a leader in one of the prayer movements in Australia, you wouldn't believe the stuff I get in my inbox. It just reminds me that God wants to open our minds afresh to actually what he's doing at this time. Because we can easily get focused on one thing, but he's not just doing one thing. He's doing multiple things at this time. He's rearranging things. You're worried about your kid's salvation? He's planning their home in heaven. And he knows what it's going to take to get them there. Can you trust him that he's doing that? Because you know what? You know, some of my friends that I talk to are worried about it. I'm thinking, mate, you didn't give your life to the Lord till you're 25. Your son's only 18. What's the issue? Like, you know what I'm saying is God worked it out in your life. He's going to work it out in your kids. You know, he is their father just as much as he's your father. And he has a plan and purpose for them. Does that mean we don't? get distraught <laughs> at what they do. Tell my son gets up to some stuff, pushes some boundaries. But you know what? Keep loving them, keep talking to them, keep walking beside them. Yes, pray for them, believe. But don't pray what you want to be done to happen. Ask God, God, what's your plan for them? How do I... Because he is interceding for them just as much as he's interceding for you on the throne room of God. We like to control. Have you... This has got to happen. You've got to do it this way. And God, you have to move like this. He has to give his life to the Lord at this time and go to Bible college then and do this. You know, you've got it all planned out, I know. But you know what? God actually had it planned out before time began, as written down in the book. So it is partnering with him. Ken, um, let's have the musos up. Thank you, guys. What a, it's been a wonderful morning. Has God been speaking to you this morning? Yes. Sally sent me this prayer the, yesterday um, by Anne. Oh, Anne's. Hamilton, her name's it. If you ever get to read any of Anne Hamilton's stuff, follow her on Facebook. She's a very, she's, she's a mathematician who likes God, just likes to unpack some stuff. I'm going to pray this prayer and then let's just sit while the musos just quietly pray because I, and just ask God, God, what's on your heart for me today? Heavenly Father, gracious King, may your name be honoured and hallowed and kept holy in this prayer and every prayer I place before you. You're the loveliest of fragrances send from the may the loveliest of fragrances send from the prayer altar. May the incense of my petitions be pleasing to you. Forgive me for the times my words, my thoughts, my attitudes, my requests have been dishonourable and displeasing to you. (laughs) You know, when we come with our agenda, that's actually being dishonorable to God. Forgive me for clinging to the very habits that hinder the acceptance of my prayers. Forgive me for expecting you to simply answer me, regardless of any conditions in your word. Forgive me for thinking you would ignore your own decrees in order to grant my requests. Forgive me for being disappointed in you when you didn't. Forgive me for the dishonor, known and unknown, that I have offered to you in prayer. In truth, Father, I don't know how to honor you as you deserve to be honored, nor how to honor you in a way that you would see as honorable. I repent of not honoring you, and I repent of taking on the disrespect of my culture and society and projecting it towards you. Because I do not know how to pray in a way that honors and glorifies you as you should be honored and glorified and counted worthy of all praise. 
I ask that Jesus, my mediator, takes my words and purifies them and then offers this prayer to you in a fitting manner. Oh, with all due courtesy and reverence, giving to you all honor and glory with joy and thanksgiving. Lord, I ask you to heal me of the taint of dishonor. I ask that you teach me through the revelation of your Holy Spirit how to honor you rightly, how to lift up your name in perfect praise, how to bring glory to your name in my community and nation. Where I have reaped disease and distress because of dishonor in prayer, I ask you to touch my life with the healing power of Jesus. I ask the fringe of this prayer shawl trails over me with steams of healing. Where I have reaped dishonor and has returned to me because I spoke it and acted it out towards others, I ask for help and healing. I repent, Lord, of the dishonor and ask that through the power of the cross of Jesus, my words of repentance are endowed by you with the ability to truly change the mind and transform my being. I ask for healing to flow. I ask for your healing to flow to those I've dishonored. And I ask that you cut off from them any thought that they have may deserve the dishonor I pushed into, onto them. Lord, I repent of accepting dishonor and taking it on. I repent of believing that I am unworthy of honor and ask, and again, I ask that my repentance be empowered by the cross of Jesus in his name. Amen. Aaron's going to come up and finish the service. I'm going to pray. I'll be down the front if any of you guys want prayer. And I know the team will be here to pray too. Father, I pray that you would speak right now to each one individually. Lord, you're bringing re you're reordering things this morning. It was decreed in the prophetic words. Lord, now you're specifically talking to each one about the specific things you would like reordered. Call their name, Jesus. Call their name. Call their individual names. And may they respond to you as Mary did. Jesus. Jesus. And may you embrace them and love them and melt away the hurt, the pain, the bitterness that some have been carrying even since they were a child. Father, I ask that you'd give a fresh vision to them this morning. <laughs> you would invite them on a fresh journey, a journey that redeems time and a journey that sets them up to receive all that you have for them in Jesus' name.